Uh, our presenter is more than just a BH staffer, a director, a judge, and a coach. Uh, he's my friend, and he's shifting the world's view of this wonderful art form of barbershop. I really mean that. Would you please welcome HU's keynote speaker, Mr. Joe Cerruti. Hello, Harmony University. How do you like my jacket? <laughs> they give these out for doing keynote addresses at Harmony University. I wondered the very thing that you were wondering right now, why, of course, would I be asked to do the keynote address? But then I realized that just last week, Deke Sharon said no, and I was the only one that would do it. I lie, actually. Kirk Young would probably do it, but who wants to listen to Kirk Young for 30 minutes? <laughs> many, many of my heroes have given this address, and as I prepared my thoughts, I have to be quite honest, the nerves really began to build up, and I thought to all of the great people who have done keynote addresses, Joe Lyles and Dave Stevens and Jim Henry, but then I thought back to last year's keynote address, and I thought, I'm going to be just fine. <laughs> I, am, I am honestly humbled and honored to speak to such an outstanding collection of people. I say that from the bottom of my heart. I've been asked to speak from a personal perspective as a former music educator and chorus director. You know, in Western music, there are only 12 notes to work from. But think of what the world's greatest composers have done with those 12 notes. There are only seven colors in the rainbow and look at what God has created with those seven colors. Each note serves a purpose in creating a masterpiece. Each color plays a unique role in coloring the world. They don't have to be complicated and what we do doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to serve a purpose. I'm certain that my life was destined to be deeply involved in the Barbershop Harmony Society. I've been active in our organization as a singer and coach, faculty and music judge, society board member, and now a staff member. But my time spent directing the Alexandria Harmonizers has influenced the purpose of my life for almost 10 years now. Dr. Greg Line affectionately calls the Alexandria Harmonizers his Pentagon men as we're a chapter largely made up of type A, spreadsheet-loving, active and retired military and government employees. <laughs> as such, we're fixated on knowing the what of any given detail, but the difference between what and why is something that's becoming a critical motivator in our development. Understanding the what is easy, but understanding the why is so much more important. Because when you know your why, you have options for the outcome of your what. For instance, our why is enriching lives through excellence in a cappella harmony. But our what could be recruiting, performing, educating, fundraising. I often use heart of my heart to demonstrate the why in a way that many of you will probably experience in some variation this week. Can I have an A flat? Let's sing heart of my heart. Beautiful, no doubt, but the song carries less meaning unless you can understand and feel why the performer is singing it. We all have choruses and even quartets made up of singers of varying ages, lifestyles, experiences, and when you sing a song like Heart of My Heart, you risk either not knowing your why or having so many whys that the song loses its meaning. For instance, if it were to be sung by a 23-year-old about to ask his college sweetheart to marry him, it might sound like this. Heart of my heart, I love you. Life would be naught without you. And if it happened to be sung by a middle-aged man, maybe going through a divorce, it might sound like this. Heart of my heart, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. 
And if it were sung by, say, an 80-year-old whose loved one of 54 years just entered hospice, it might sound like this. Heart of my heart, I love you. Life would be not without you. Any successful interpretation requires a personal connection, an understanding of subtext. Now, I think we'd all agree that Heart of My Heart is a love song. But how long... <laughs> The rumor is true. The rumor is true. <laughs> but how long do we have to sing about love before it becomes uninteresting? It certainly depends on the performance, but for most audiences, it only takes about 10 seconds of monotony before your brain starts wondering if there's going to be ice cream tonight after the opening session, <laughs> or if your roommate is going to be snoring all week. <laughs> So to keep our performers and the audience present, we have to break the love song down into more meaningful components. There are probably a thousand different words that fall under the umbrella of love. So let's break down the first phrases and sing it with a renewed understanding of why. First, take a moment and think of a special person to you that you would sing this song to. Now, instead of singing the first phrase with the generic emotion of love, let's use the lyric, heart of my heart. It's almost like a romantic nickname of sorts, like sweetheart, dear, or schnookums. And then we express, I love you, or I adore you. So let's sing that first phrase with a sense of adoration. But for the second phrase, I want you to think of what life would be like if you had never met that person. With a sense of almost desperation, life would be not without you. Let's have an A-flat again. Adoration. go much further with this exercise, but I'm sure you get the point. The first time we sang Heart of My Heart, we knew what we were doing. We had notes, but no symphony, colors, but no rainbow. But in the renditions that followed, we started to understand why we were doing it, and our message begun to take shape. This is one of the most unique things about Barbershop. If we had 10 groups interpret any barbershop song, they'd all be unique and different, and they would all be right. When you define your why, your what has more impact, because you're walking towards your purpose. The Alexandria Harmonizers will soon celebrate their 70th anniversary as a chapter of the Barbershop Harmony Society. Thank you. And over that time, we have had a wealth of memorable experiences. Four international championships and 19 international chorus medals, five guest appearances on CBS's Kennedy Center Honors, a short feature on NBC's America's Got Talent, various performances at Carnegie Hall, the White House, the Supreme Court, along various artists as author and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel, and Harry Connick Jr., and do not let that picture fool you. That is my genuine stalker face. <laughs> it is a theme. It is a recurring theme in many of the photos that you'll see. <laughs> but being an established ensemble in the nation's capital, we are fortunate to experience some of the coolest gigs possible, but there are many other less glamorous things we do that have a much greater impact on our community. For instance, we hold an annual youth festival bringing hundreds of local students together to learn about Barbershop Harmony Society and their love of singing. But more importantly, we serve local educators by touring a top quartet 
through multiple middle and high schools, teaching thousands of students about the benefits of singing a cappella harmony. We support the creation of the No Borders Youth Chorus, an annual honor chorus of 150 young men from around the world, recruited and auditioned specifically for a one-day rehearsal and concert at Carnegie Hall. We collaborated with a steel drum ensemble of some of the most talented inner city kids from DC on our holiday show. And if you want to hear something wild, barbershop and steel drum music. <laughs> We produce an annual competition for college a cappella groups to show off their talents, and we perform to hundreds of local elementary school kids on Veterans Day to remind them of the sacrifice made by many local heroes to protect their safety. And we provide a free singing Valentine's program to the local community, bringing the gift of song to veterans, the elderly, and at-risk communities throughout the greater DC area during a time that can be very lonely for many. These opportunities only highlight the 20 to 30 services and performances that we provide annually to enrich our community and to help us to better understand why we sing and how it has an impact on all of the lives involved. When I started directing the Alexandria Harmonizers almost 10 years ago, all I ever hoped for was an international chorus medal. I can't begin to tell you the number of times I would pray right before the chorus call-off, the metal call-off. Please, please, OC Cash, if I get a medal, I'll change my life. I'll eat better, I'll exercise. I'll raise my contribution to the Harmony Foundation. I'll even teach my chorus to sing more polecats. But after earning a few medals, we realized that we were spending such a wealth of time pursuing a medal that we never realized the opportunities in our own community that were passing us by. After tying for sixth place in Nashville, so many of our friends treated us like there was a death in the family. They came up and, how are you doing? Is everything okay? <laughs> Let me tell you something, the quality of choruses and quartets in our organization is getting so amazingly high, our top groups raise the ceiling every year, and just earning a medal anymore is like a gold medal moment. Don't get me wrong, I always feel privileged to compete at International, but competition is just a what for us, and not the why. Still, the Nashville convention will remain a favorite convention experience for a long time because we walked into it with a purpose exceeding anything we could have earned from 15 judges. Our conventions are unique opportunities to nurture and strengthen lifelong connections with other singers from, ar from around the world, and every year we plan an exchange with a different chorus competitor in each of our rehearsals. One of those choruses this year was Vocal FX from New Zealand. <laughs> In addition to performing each other, performing for each other, uh, we worked for months leading up to Nashville to perform a haka for them. <laughs> they were incredibly respectful as we experimented with a part of their culture and then they completely schooled us on how it was supposed to be done. specific exchange with vocal effects made our sixth place tie with them so incredibly special. We are beyond honored to be tied with such an amazing group of artists that are going viral right now on social media. Perhaps our most memorable convention experience and our purpose for competing in Nashville this year 
was to honor the legacy of our director emeritus, Scott Werner, lead of vaudeville and the Nova Chords, who led the Alexandria Harmonizers to their four international chorus medal, gold medals in the 80s and 90s. Even though it was a competition, we used it as an opportunity to perform in front of the one organization who could most appropriately recognize this man as the legend that he is. I wouldn't trade competition for anything in the world. It's what has encouraged the quality of performance across our organization to reach heights we never could have expected decades ago. But when a group puts a competition as their primary reason for existence and then happens to fall short of their expectations and potential, it can have dramatic impact on confidence, commitment, and how they move into the future. Two years ago, the Alexandria Harmonizers sat out of competition to accept the invitation to entertain for the ceremonies commemorating the 70th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy, France. Having a wealth of active and retired military in the chorus, this trip was very close to us. But our why for this journey came to us from watching TV one Saturday morning. Over 72 years ago, General Dwight Eisenhower gave the final order for the Allied invasion of Normandy. And among the Americans who fought to liberate Europe was First Lieutenant Billy Harris. On D-Day, Billy's plane was shot down over Normandy and it was destined to crash in the small town of Levant, France. Billy was faced with a decision. He could eject and save his life, return to his bride and leave his plane to crash into a village, killing dozens, or risk his life steering the plane away from the village, saving the town and its residents. He chose the latter, and as a hero in death, the people of Levant witnessed Billy's heroic crash and buried him in their local cemetery, covering his grave in flowers knee-deep. Even after his body was moved to the American cemetery in Normandy, the town continued to take flowers to his grave. Just six weeks before that fateful day, Billy married his high school sweetheart, Peggy. And after Billy's courageous death, Peggy would spend the next 65 years searching for answers on the whereabouts of her husband. She never got a knock at the door or anything definitive explaining what happened to her husband. First, he was reported as alive and coming home. Then Peggy got a letter saying he'd actually been killed and buried in one cemetery. Then another letter saying he was in a different cemetery. Then she was told they aren't sure they had his remains at all. Months turned into years, and years turned into decades. Peggy wrote repeatedly to her congressman asking for any information regarding the fate of her husband, and as recent as 2005, received a response stating that Billy was still listed as missing in action in the National Archives. Billy's cousin decided to try and get to the bottom of it for Peggy. He started by requesting Billy's military records, and that's all it took. As it turns out, there was no record of the congressman checking, in the re checking the records in the National Archives, and if he had, he would have seen Billy's status as uh, killed in action and buried at the world's most famous cemetery along its most well-traveled path. Since learning her husband was buried at the American Cemetery in Normandy, Peggy sends flowers 10 times a year, making his grave the most decorated in all of Normandy. Cemetery officials say she's also, as far as they know, the last widow who still visits there. While it took Peggy over six decades of battling bureaucracy to learn his fate, she finally discovered how much the people of one small French town have loved and honored her husband almost as long as she has. Well, after seeing this story on CBS Sunday morning, one of our French-speaking members contacted the mayor of Levant to pursue a performance in their town while we were in France. Another member reached out to Peggy Harris to let her know that we were planning to do a performance in Levant dedicated to her and the memory of her husband. Now, we never expected her to make an effort to see this little barbershop chorus from Virginia that she had never heard of before. 
But when she heard this news, she decided to fly from Dallas to Paris at the age of 92 and meet us in Levant for this special performance in their honor. So during our trip between performing at two D-Day ceremonies, the tiny village of Levant rolled out their red carpet for us. 110 harmonizers with over 100 family in tow took three double-decker coach buses down a tiny dirt road. A young boy on a bike guided us to the village whose main road is called Place Billy D. Harris. The reception was so much more than we ever expected. The town crowded the streets and greeted the buses like we were celebrities, waving banners and cheering. The local people, uh, uh, there was a local couple that was supposed to be married in the town that day, and they postponed their wedding to greet us there and share in the experience honoring Billy and Peggy. The town actually didn't have a building that could accommodate more than 100 people, so we stood outside of their town hall. We greeted Peggy, who literally hitched a three-hour ride from Paris, and we performed for the hundreds of people who showed up for an experience I will never have enough words to appropriately describe. The opportunity to meet and perform for this 92-year-old widow and this very special community in France motivated us to deliver one of the most heartfelt, emotional performances ever. By the end of the performance, we were all cheering, crying, and celebrating the life of a hero that fought for our country, the freedom of the French people, and who saved their town almost 70 years ago. This story defines why we sing and resulted in an annual concert that we do in our hometown every Armed Forces Day to honor all of the Billies and Peggies that are right in our community. Now, these experiences didn't just come to us. We make them happen, and you can too. There are heroes in every single neighborhood and community around the world, and their stories are just waiting to be sung. Experiences like these inspired us to align ourselves closer to a community choral arts organization. Now, I won't bore you any longer with the details, but the steps we took in the last few years prepared us to be available to accept the invitation for one of the most transformative experiences in our 70-year history. Last April, we performed with the National Philharmonic Orchestra as a part of Broadway composer Andrew Lippa's world premiere of I Am Ann Hutchinson, I Am Harvey Milk, a contemporary oratorio featuring Tony Tony and Emmy Award-winning Kristen Chenoweth. Accepting this performance was not an easy decision to make. We took a huge risk that our members would commit to taking on a work that was so graphically confronting matters of social justice. The music was extremely challenging. The topic was sociopolitical. The lyrics were transgressive. Besides all of that, preparing a major 60-minute work to be memorized with choreography in in, in just a few months' time while preparing for the Barbershop Harmony Society's international competition was going to be a monumental undertaking. Fortunately, our membership backed uh, backed us up on our decision to accept this performance, and we started another life-changing journey together. Some would say the most significant in our chapter's history. We had to acquire new rehearsal skills, less used in barbershop, and we worked every week to behave as true professionals rather than a chorus of Kristen Chenoweth fanboys. (laughs) Our first experience with the professional Broadway team was a rehearsal with Joel Fram. Joel is the international music supervisor for all performances of Wicked worldwide. And he was the music director for this performance. He took an evening off of Broadway to visit our rehearsal and help us prepare for the performance. We prepared for this as if we were taking this music to contest. We were on top of the pitch. We were note, word, rhythm perfect, in character and emotion, almost completely memorized by this point. We were as ready as we could have been. And after a few minutes of rehearsing, he seemed pretty unhappy with something, and he stopped. And he said, oh, 
It's so in tune. <laughs> <sighs> Our jaws were on the floor. <laughs> he knew that there were flaws and emotions and experiences that we were sweeping under the carpet all for the sake of unity. He led us through a number of rehearsal techniques that demanded a total performance from us. He wanted to experience all of our flaws. He wanted to experience all of our individualism. He wanted the most raw human performance possible, and this was one of the most difficult and liberating experiences we could have ever had. There are a few of the less contro here are a few of the less controversial highlights from that performance. One of the most memorable moments was when we were told at the conclusion of the last performance, we would be allowed a personal opportunity to celebrate with Kristen Chenoweth. As we prepared to meet her, I had hoped to express how grateful we were to have been afforded this opportunity to participate in such a life-changing experience. And that rubbing elbows with her is probably what attracted us to accept the performance in the beginning but the powerful message quickly surpassed her star power and became our life's purpose for those few months. I wanted to tell her that we strive to create a better world through singing every day, but that day, we didn't have to go too far to find lives that have, had been changed by this particular experience. Well, the time had come, and while I had intended to say all of that, all I could say was, I'm the director. <laughs> That's right, she entered the room, I stood there staring. She said, are you the director? And I said, I'm the director. <laughs> I don't share these stories just because they were cool experiences. They definitely were and we were so fortunate to have been invited, but the most rewarding element of the experience was to deliver the, to deliver the true message of the oratorio to our community, which was one of tolerance and kindness, love and understanding among all people. Because any group of people pouring out their hearts and souls in harmony is an emblem for what we need more of in this world. As barber shoppers, we just need to focus on it outside of our little organization. Imagine what would happen if our chapters turned their focus to their communities and invested the amount of time spent on contest to changing lives and creating better community through singing. Who in this room is tired of hearing about all of the awful things going on lately? For some reason, you never hear that they just happened by someone who just left their chorus rehearsal. <laughs> We're pretty quick to blame the government on social media, but we have the solution right here in this room. 
But it doesn't do us any good if it stays in this room. There's a world out there that needs our music. There are neighborhoods and communities in the hometowns of every person in this room that need to experience the benefits of singing, not just barbershop, but singing any and all good music in their lives. You see, what we do, singing, has value. It has significant value. It's not one of life's frills. It's something that goes to the very heart of our humanity, our sense of community and our souls. When you sing, and I don't mean to win a contest, but when you simply sing, you create something that is much more than the sum of the parts. A chemical composition of the body changes while singing. And when singing is done with heart, with pure, unadulterated purpose and meaning, the why that I keep referring to is cathartic. It teaches us about ourselves and it teaches the people in our audiences about why we're doing what we're doing. For the BHS, musical excellence is, of course, at the heart of it. But even if a choir is not the greatest in the world, the fact that they're meeting together still has social value. It has communal value. The next six days here are going to be so valuable for growing and understanding why we sing together. We will experience hours upon hours of sharing these connections with each other this week and we'll share it with the community of Nashville on Saturday. I believe this experience is so valuable and hold such a special place in the lives of those who attend, that of all of the amazing experiences that the Alexandria Harmonizers have had over the years, I find it hard to believe that this was not one of them. So earlier last week, I confirmed that my chorus will share this exact experience at Harmony University next year. We will all leave this mountaintop weekend thinking, boy, you know, if we could only spend a whole month together like this, or if everyone participated in events like this, there would be less problems in the world. But I think that we're looking at it the wrong way. Our being here is now a responsibility to take this feeling, to take this culture of listening and learning, accepting and sharing and singing back to your community and have an impact because the music that we create does make a difference. But we, can our, we cannot expect our community just to come to us. We have to be relevant and accessible to the outside world. We have to know why and live it on a weekly basis so our music and our communication matches that very purpose because understanding and believing in these things has exponential effects on the greater good. I am grateful for your dedication to this organization, and I am even more grateful to your families for being tolerant of the time and effort it takes to do something that makes a difference to the lives in this room, and more importantly, everywhere we take our music. Thank you.